Ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of The Bird Calls. I am David Grubb, and I'm joined, as always, by Editor-in-Chief of TheBirdRights.com, Mr. Ali Cosell. Ali, the Pelican season has come to an end, and it came to an end with a resounding thud on Wednesday night at the Smoothie King Center. Pels lose to the Thunder, 113-108. You were in the blender that night, taking it all in for the finale. Then you were at uh, Media Day today. The main thing that I want to get out for, for, as we do this, because we'll get a little bit into the basketball. I don't want to spend a ton of time because the game itself spoke for itself. There's some things I want to hit on. And I want to hit on some of the things that you that were discussed today at the uh, exit interviews. But ultimately, as we wrap this season up, the question is, is this a, a season a success or failure is how people want to frame it. I, I think there are successes and failures. We couldn't agree more because when you just ask a question in general, just like that, it's really hard to say because you can go in two directions. You can be optimistic and talk about the winning record, right? 42 and 40. It's been what, five years since they finished over 500. There was the fact that they started off really well and it showed really to the degree of what this talent is capable of. And then, of course, I, I really enjoyed the fact that they were able to salvage what was a ship going south. I don't think any of us expected for them to make a move back up the standings and put themselves in a legitimate chance to even get a five or six seed, right? I mean, I know that they fell out, of course, lost the first playing game. But, boy, if just one or two of those regular season games go differently and they win, they're, like I said, a five or a six seed, and we're having an entirely different conversation right now. But on the negative side, right, it's easy to point to not being able to find a way out of that hole, right? That 10 game losing streak, we talked about it multiple times, shouldn't have happened. The coaches needed to maybe do something differently. Um, coming to rotations, to certain players, to the effort levels, to not being able to just dot all the I's and cross all the T's by doing the simple fundamentals, right? I think that drives anybody crazy that's a longtime basketball follower, right? Boxing out, especially when it comes to free throw attempts, to making the simple pass to playing within oneself, to going to your strengths when there's mismatches on the floor. And I'm obviously talking about maybe utilizing Jonas Valanciunas more, things of that nature. So from that standpoint, you feel like that they did not execute during the second half of the season. And of course, I think the biggest self in the room is the fact that this team finished 29th in three-point shooting, right, in terms of volume. That's not good enough in today's game. Everybody knows that. And for a team that shot, I think they finished 15th in conversion rate, right? Right in the middle of the pack. You should have probably taken a little bit more advantage of. You should have probably utilize Trey Murphy a little bit more. You should probably get in CJ McCollum a little bit easier looks. And Brandon Ingram, he really seemed to avoid looking for his own three-point shot, right? He he bounced back after, a, you know, an offseason last year shooting the ball from distance. So that combined with, of course, I think what fans will point to, David, is the fact that they didn't make it into the playoffs. They took – in their minds, a step back from last season, which I honestly don't agree with, right? And of course, I guess we're going to get to it, Zion. It almost seems like we're rehashing what happened a year ago with how long it took for him to get back from, come back from his injury, to having a setback, to having certain confidence issues and hesitancy in coming back. It seems like we're there again. And questions about the relationship that he has with the Pelicans. And we'll get into that in a, in a minute. Um, Cause I think that, that there's so much speculation that we just have to address it. But to me, the, the, the game on Wednesday encapsulated the season in a lot of ways. The first half was much like the first half of the season. There was, there were good things. The Pelicans stayed within themselves for the most part. Um, they weren't perfect in the first half of the game, but they came out with a halftime lead and you, and they did the things overall that they were supposed to do. Jonas had a double-double. Trey got shots. B.I. looked good, you know, for most of the first half. Um, you didn't get a bad – you weren't getting a bad performance from C.J. up to that point. It was an okay performance. And you were getting an assertive Herb Jones. All the things you wanted, and you were keeping, you know, you were keeping the thunder, taking the shots overall that you wanted them to take. They had more threes than you would have liked to, at the start of the game. But in the second quarter, they really didn't hit a bunch of threes in the second quarter um, uh, 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 of the game. So at the half, it was like the season. And then the second half, exactly the same thing. A third quarter, like the third the, 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 the third quarter of the season, where it's a complete fall down, 
And then in the fourth quarter where they scrapped and fought and put themselves in a position, but ultimately come up short. That's the season, you know, because you look at it in this game, the Pelicans only turned it over 11 times on any other day. You say, that's good. That's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they were still a minus four. You talk about shot creation, Trey Murphy, the third, five shot attempts in the second half, one in the fourth quarter. That mm-hmm. was something we highlighted before last, last week when we talked about this game was that they had to create shots for that were easy for Trey and for JV. No shots in the third quarter, only two shot attempts in the fourth. He makes both of those, one of those a corner three. So you get a good, a really good performance out of JV. The free throws, SGA, zero free throw attempts in the first half. The Thunder get 22 free throw attempts in the second half. The Pelicans were plus six in the first half, minus nine in points at the line, minus eight in attempts. Points of the paint, of course, the other big factor. The Pelicans minus six for the game. They were up a 12 in points of the paint in the first half and end up minus six. Third quarter alone, they give up 24 points in the paint. Just ridiculous. So, you know, those things, all the things that we said would have to go wrong for the Pelicans to lose this game, that's exactly what they did in the second half. They did. And they start right out of halftime. Shea was the one that set the tone. I want to say he scored like the first eight points. Went four for four, maybe even five for five. I can't remember for sure. But it wasn't that Herb Jones suddenly slipped. It's just that he figured out where he was going to get his shots from, right? And I saw him come out of halftime. And you know what he practiced? A couple of those long jumpers he was going to get, those threes. And guess what? That carried over into that play of the third quarter, and he nailed it. And that, like I said, I feel like that set the tone because, boy, they were hanging on by what? Lou Dort making a whole bunch of shots in that first half. And Giddy kind of going. Giddy kept it up the whole game. I mean, hats off to him too, right? What, he finished with 31 points or something like that? And he was just effective everywhere. He was getting some rebounds, um, making the right plays. As for the Pelicans, they just didn't get that. To me, I felt like their best stretch was honestly at the start of the fourth quarter, where you felt like, wow, the Pelicans are probably headed for a loss. And we were talking about that right amongst ourselves Mm -hmm. on on our DM chat, that this really felt like a lot of those losses, as as you just alluded to, and yet they did. They found that energy. And, and, and a bench, right, a unit that's um, around C.J. McCollum that struggled, right, coming down to three weeks, whenever B.I. sat, boy, did they struggle. But they came out, and like I said, they even retook the lead. They just couldn't sustain it, David. And, and that, I guess that's the worst part about all of this is, is the fact that the Pelicans, I feel like they gave that effort, but they just couldn't they, – they couldn't do everything necessary to win a game. So it's irregardless of making shots, Right. right? C.J. McCollum, he's been hit or miss since his thumb injury, so you can't blame anything on him. B.I. really started getting – found it more difficult, right, finding his shots. Trey couldn't get his open three-point looks or drives like he had in the first half. Same thing with Herb, right? I mean, I think both of those guys combined for like 35 points in the first half. They were spectacular, but none of that came easy in the second half. And, of course, when you don't have a Zion out there – well, we saw what happened, right? They struggled offensively, as you mentioned, really symbolic of that second half of the season where the offense struggled to find their shots within the offense. And and then the the, the 13 offensive rebounds they gave up. Yeah. You know, when people look at this and they, they'll say, well, they, they didn't shoot well in that game. It's not the shooting. We've seen the Pelicans shoot poorly and win games. Mm-hmm. The things that they didn't do well were the mental parts of the game and the little physical things effort things that you have to do box. Like you said, boxing out, executing, turning it over at that last stretch. Yeah, it out the fundamentals, Cause I saw guys running, right. Giving multiple efforts. But it was the fact of doing the smart, right play at the moment. Yeah. And, 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 and knowing that when in the third quarter, like you, it was just consecutive, you give it to SGA or you give it to, to Josh Giddy, and they were driving it right into the chest of the Pelicans mm-hmm. defense and getting as close as they could to the basket. And then saying, I'm going to make a move from here. And there was no one in the front court who was willing to come over and make a play or who could make a play. Jonas is on the bench when he's on the bench and they're playing Herb at center on occasions or you're using Jackson. And Jackson, again, he got some boards, but no blocks, not a single block for Jax on a team, again, that does not have a lot of height and was going to the same spot over and over again. You knew exactly where they were going in that third quarter. Yeah. I mean, look, David, I think – if they would have had a healthy Larry Nance, I think they win that game. We saw what he was able to do in the first half. And and the same thing goes with if Jose Alvarado had been available and able to play up to his standards. Because once again, I feel like the bench just didn't give you much. And and that was really the the tale of the recipe for as to where they were strong for 
what, maybe six eighths of the season, they suddenly were so, so unreliable, right? When you have to rely on, on, a, on a Larry Nance on one leg, Josh Richardson, who honestly is just who he is. And then Willie Green trying to find that point guard solution, right? He was given the minutes to Dyson Daniels, but then he didn't play in game in uh, Minnesota. And then he went to Kyra Lewis in that playing game. I thought Kyra brought the right energy, was moving right, but I think the game was a little bit too big for him, right? I mean, he shot that he hadn't first played it a week. Shot it past the rim. Then he had a layup in transition, just missed it badly. So naturally butterflies. So like I said, you just needed more positive contributions and he just didn't get it. It's it was is obvious that, you know, again, you talk when you talk about the bench, you talk about its lack of production. I think part of that comes from people not understanding their roles and feeling confident in their roles. Because if you are Kyra Lewis, did you know going into this game that you were going to be an important part? He did. We asked him. He did. So, you know, it's it. even then, I think it, it confused a lot of fans to see it. Um, the, the rotation change up the way it did. You knew it had to change. Once we talked about this hours, as soon as they said that Larry was questionable, we're saying, okay, we know Jax is back in the rotation because Jax had played consistent minutes against Oklahoma City at the very least, during the season. That may not have been the case if they had advanced, but you knew that Jax had gotten minutes consistently against Oklahoma City during the regular season, so it wasn't a surprise that he was out there. Um, but, but David, it, let me add this. Larry even said today that he had a conversation, right, intense conversation with the uh, coaching staff, that he didn't feel right in the Minnesota game, obviously, and he thought that he would hurt them in that playing game. So he made that difficult decision, like, I'm better off sitting on the bench. So that's why they went with Jackson. I can't blame Willie for trying new things because let's face it, we just said it. The bench had been struggling badly during the last couple of weeks. So going to Kyra, going to Jackson makes sense. But the fact that they hadn't been playing now for weeks, right, to put them in that that spotlight, yeah, you can't win games like that, right, because the continuity is not out there. And the trust. The trust yeah, but, most important. Yeah, but we got to get this right, though. I, I hope fans understand that we don't want to point to injuries as, as an excuse. They but should look, have won. It doesn't matter in certain games, right? And I'm not talking about Zion or Brandon Ingram for their long stretches they miss, but it's the fact that you don't even have Jose Alvarado for 21 games this season. It hurt down the stretch. Herb Jones missed 15 games this season. Actually, 16. Trey Murphy missed a bunch. Larry, too. When all of a sudden you're going through all these different guys that are out for extended absences, honestly, it does make it difficult for the coaching staff and for the rotations to do a solid job. It's it's just a fact of life because the parity is incredible in the NBA. I don't think I've ever seen to where almost any team on any given night can in reality win, David. I don't know about you, but I think that honestly today, the biggest decisive factor is health. And if you look at games missed on the season, Pels had third most, 271. You look at the two teams that missed the least, the Kings and the Knicks. Because of that fact, I think, without a doubt, they far exceed their expectations. Look where they are, right? The Kings finished third in the West and the Knicks fifth. They weren't supposed to be there. But because they enjoyed that good health, there you go. And I think for the Kings, the the biggest part of health is not just the availability. It's the continuity. And the Kings got to have their regular lineups. Now, Willie... This year was not close to the worst year we've seen lineup wise for the Pelicans and health wise over the last decade or so. It's it, it it was better than last year actually overall. The Pelicans were better than last year, and then it was even better than Alvin's first year as well. It wasn't as good. Stan had the healthiest year of the oh, by far. Because let's not forget, CJ played for three months with a bad mm-hmm. thumb. And as I wrote in the article, when I shook his hand, I was blown away at how lightly he gripped my hand. And then I immediately asked Rod Walker, hey, did uh, CJ shake your hand? He's like, yeah. I'm like, did you notice how barely he grabbed you? He's like, yeah. Because he's like, I went to squeeze it, and I noticed he wasn't doing it, so I let up. So, yeah, that just tells you just how much, honestly, to me, pain and discomfort CJ's been playing with. So when you say that the continuity is better, yes, in the sense that the bodies are out there, but in terms of their abilities, no. CJ was by far a much more effective player because he was much healthier, right? Yeah, and then you you take – because there is no Jose and you don't have guys that you trust to handle the ball, that's why CJ's out there for 40 minutes Mm -hmm. with that busted thumb. And I know a lot of people say, well, he's still – he's out there. He can't go five for 15. Yeah, you don't want to go five for 15. But, again, I don't put that shooting as to why they lost. It's the other things. In a, exactly. play, in a postseason game. There's so many ways to win a game, right? It doesn't going to happen. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, it's going to happen. It's the other things that the Pelicans were unable to do, which also helped create the five for 15 because there weren't good shots to go around. There was a lot of standstill in the third quarter in particular. It became a lot tougher. And when you cannot handle the ball, like CJ really can't, but you're forced, there's only two ball handlers on this team. I mean, you know, primarily it's either in Brandon's hand for the possession or it's in CJ's hands. And so I think we have to understand that. And 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 as you um, wrote today, and I think people need to check that out if they haven't, what CJ did is not about shaming anybody. What he said was not about shaming anybody. The whole point, the reason everybody was so excited about him coming was being, he and Larry in particular, mm -hmm. becoming the adults in the room and telling guys what it meant to be a professional NBA player. When CJ says you got to take everything seriously, he's yeah, saying that because he wants it for you. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned prior years and the continuity. But the thing missing, of course, was I think that veteran presence. Stan didn't have it. Alvin largely didn't have it. I mean, I know JJ Redick was here, but he's not the guy that can lead. JJ right? and Drew were not those guys. No, it, it takes a certain person to be able to fill those shoes. And I know CJ definitely can. Whether you hear his message or not, that's another thing, and I'm sure we'll get into it. Same thing with Larry. But I feel like that Griff, from that standpoint, did very well in making that trade, right? It wasn't just for adding a guard that could score points on the outside, but, boy, they needed that adult in that room last year, and I feel like that helped immensely. And I know that really helped Zion, too, especially initially, because he's a guy that, honestly, I think you need to have a lot of people in his ear telling him the right things because he's not – yet in, at, at that point in his career or at that age to where he knows how to assimilate what he's hearing, the noise with what's going on with his body and maintain a positive attitude, maintain focus on what he should be doing, right? In terms of conditioning, eating right, who he should be listening to. So I feel like Griff attempted to push a lot of the right buttons. And we're at that point now, and I guess we'll probably move now here into Zion. Now it's honestly the ball, it sits in Zion's court for me. I don't know what you have made of the last, let's say last week since Zion spoke and some of the rumors have come out and what Griff talked about today. But the elephant in the room now regarding the Pelicans moving forward is against Zion. Yeah, it's the timing of everything, I think, didn't suit anyone well. That's, you know, I, I want to, I don't think Griff was trying to throw Zion under the bus. And I don't no. think Zion. The way Zion said things did not help him. He and I think it's right. Some, he misspoke. Somebody did he him a misspoke. I'm fine, and you go out dunking. Right. That's the wrong message. And I think everybody needs to remember too is that you got to protect Zion from himself at times. Because my thought was that they had no business letting him on the court before the game. Because even if he's worked out, worked at working out and trying to get himself ready for game two or next week. If they, you know, if they thought they were going to make the playoffs, you don't throw that, that chum to the sharks of them seeing him right after he said what he said. Cause when you say I'm not able to go, but the, the, the visual is, and as we've seen in social media and throughout the thing, everybody said, Oh, he's doing dunk contest dunks. No, he was not. Okay. I, I'm telling you though. He's not, that was not explosion that I saw. But it no, he was again well matter. above the rim, right? It wasn't effortless, right? But it, and that's the thing is, I you know we know looking at him, he's not right. He didn't say it well, and then that visual, I think, really hurts Zion going into the summer. And somebody asked me about it, and I want to get your thought on this. My impression is this: that the, that the people around Zion, if if their advice is if if their advice is they didn't want him. And people say, well, why wouldn't you just let him go out and play? Because even if he looks bad, he's still playing and he can see what it's like. Yeah, I understand that thought completely. Here's the other side of that. I can never unsee Zion looking bad on the court if I'm thinking about it from Zion's image side. I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying you're thinking I can't. If Zion goes out there and embarrasses himself, if he had gone out there and people just lit him up and they were scoring on him left and right, that tape is forever. But if I and let him not play and they go through the summer and he comes back and next year he's healthy and, the, and he's playing great again, they will forget this because of that. Not saying it's right, but I'm saying that's the thought. Yeah, and here's my two points. Number one, Pelicans tried this. 
they tried to bring him back probably quicker than they wanted to when he wasn't in shape back in the bubble. And you remember how poorly, right, that 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 experiment went? He didn't look anything like himself. And, of course, the Pelicans lost every they, 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 they were just bad right in, in the bubble nobody seemed to bring any effort and it just permeated right through the entire roster and i think a large large part of it stemmed with zion because there was this hope that and everybody saw the pictures beforehand of him working out in uh the gym and how well he looked right he physically looked ready for it but then that setback the hamstring issue i believe it was uh in the bubble where he had to leave some for a period or so and then come back he wasn't the same player. So that experiment went awry. And the other thing I want to mention too, and I hope people understand this, it wasn't that fact that Zion didn't want to play. He wasn't cleared to play basketball. He hadn't even progressed to five on five. And that was my biggest thing that I kept on saying, right? In our DM chats, our texts. Look, until I hear that Zion's going five on five full court, like he was prior to retweaking that hamstring strain, then I knew it made no sense for him to come on the court. And I remember you saying the same thing. In fact, David Griffin said today that he didn't progress to three on three full court. So it yeah, sounds like still working out with so why are you going to throw out a guy that hasn't even checked these boxes, which he has to, we've learned, like I just mentioned, the bubble that didn't go right and such, because he needs to be in that kind of shape and in, in that kind of mental frame of mind, I think as well, he wouldn't have helped. So yes, him dunking in pregame hurt, but that was not exemplary of the fact that he was ready to play basketball. No, it wasn't. You know, any, if you're paying attention, you could see he was not exploding. He's he, what he was doing was just going through the muscle memory. Like that's what they're doing is this is what you would naturally do during these sequences. And that's what he did. He, there was no great power. There was no great lift. There was no great um, you know, quickness with what he was doing. It was at maybe three quarter speed. David, did maybe? it remind you of that Instagram post he had dunking when last season, right? Coming off that foot injury and he wanted to play supposedly. Well, we know he wanted to play, but. Uh, the Pelicans didn't bring him back. Because I what it remind me of you remember when we when he first came back, the debut against San Antonio, the weeks before that, when he was doing pregame, he was throwing it off the glass. He yeah. was finishing with you know two hands. He was doing all these things at the end of his workout because he was feeling ready at that point. But he had to go through the practice protocols, and they hadn't finished those yet. But he was far more explosive. We were seeing it, and we're like, when is he going to be ready now? Because you could see it. I didn't see that Wednesday. But people will take these things and run with them. Mm -hmm. So you get to today, Ali. And I think I want to leave with David Griffin's comments because I think they were the most apropos and yeah. they were dead on. And I was glad to hear them that way. We'll see if they're factual. But when he said that the best outcome of this whole thing was that they didn't fool themselves into thinking that they're better than they are. I said, yes, because over the years that we've worked together, the last two times the Pelicans made the playoffs. That was the, the takeaway at the end of the season that you and I spent a lot of time on was, okay, just because this happened this season, don't think this is going to happen next season. And I think for the first time we heard a Pelicans executive say that, mm -hmm. that they understand exactly that there are still problems. We're not good enough. And if I come back and we're in this similar position next year, even if they, I think even if they got to the first round, Next year, if they got there the same way like this, playing this way, yeah, a lot of people are going to be in trouble. And I think David Griffin publicly acknowledged that the organization from top to bottom, players, executives, coaches, had better get better during this offseason. Yeah, I, I think David spit out a lot of truth today. I also like the fact that he said during their uh, start where they, what was it, they began 23 and 12, right? Tied for first with Denver uh, towards the end of December, that they weren't really playing great basketball and if you remember I started thinking about it there was a lot of those close wins that they had to where they won because of making a player two down the stretch and just because it translates to win doesn't mean suddenly you're an elite team that everybody should consider you would be a force to be reckoned with right because I mean it was largely Zion I remember because of that seven game winning streak people were thinking championship right I mean we started hearing Zion MVP talk and that was legit but this team, I don't think, was legit at the time. And, yeah, I mean, David Griffin's comments say were so on point because this team has a lot of holes. Whether you want to start with the coaching staff in terms of utilizing all their weapons properly, as I mentioned, and as you talked about, Jonas, he was underutilized, especially when he had a favorable matchup. It just never made sense to not seeking out the three-point shot more often. 
to taking all the way until March for Trey to see shots consistently. I, I can point to so many different things that it took much longer than it feels like it should have, right? So from that standpoint, I love what Griff said. And I also like the fact that he pointed to the fact that there's going to be some changes. And it's not just with the roster, I feel like. He also mentioned he's going to take a hard look at, say, for instance, analytics. He thinks that they're not up to speed. And that makes all the sense in the world when you consider how certain games, when we think we can see stuff and it's not really cohesive with today's modern style, like shooting the three ball more regularly, they need to do a better job. They need to address those problems earlier. And even Willie Green supported that with his statement, especially off camera. He really talked about how they've just got to do a better job of shooting more than 33s or whatever they ended up shooting. Some like it's still the 20s. It's still the high 20s. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> David, I actually heard a lot of the right things from almost just about everybody. So that actually gives me more hope because, like, like you started with Griff saying that I'm glad we're not resting, you know, hope on false laurels, right? This team isn't good enough because, I mean, when you can't do the simple fundamentals of rebounding the basketball, protecting the rim, always keeping a body in front, and of course, executing offensively, going to your strengths. Well, I think that says everything you need to know. The lack of consistency on the road, those types of things, the inability. Yeah, to when you're a good team, you win on the road. Correct. Sorry. Yeah. The inability to string together wins. You know, we saw that they would win two games and then lose two, win a game, then lose one. It, it was hard for them to even get three in a row, let alone, you know, the magic five that I like. Well, to they, had, about they had the seven, the five early when Zion was healthy. And then at the and then end, they got one five at the end. So those are your three longest streaks of the season. You didn't have an, you didn't have a group of streaks, which good teams have. Good teams have cons consistently have little streaks. You don't have a three game losing streak. You don't go 10 and no, 25. You don't do that. You don't go four months without beating a good team on the road. Yeah. You know, those were the types of things you don't keep losing in Orlando. You don't have a losing record against the, the other conference. You know, that's one of those things. You've got to be at least 500 against the other conference. And the Pelicans weren't that this year. So all of those things, there are really good things. The, the home record, one of the best home records they've ever had. Defensive rating relative to the league, the, maybe the, is the best in franchise history. Though, I wouldn't say this is the best defense we've ever seen, but relative yeah. to the rest of the league, they were good defensively. The emergence of Trey uh, Murphy, the improvement for Herb Jones, particularly over the last 30 games offensively, uh, you know, Brandon Ingram pulling himself together. There's a lot of good. Yes. But one of the things we still have to look at. Yeah. Is, is, is this team mentally tough enough? Is it still old and is it mature enough in the right positions and is it flexible enough even though it has a bunch of guys who look athletic and, and all these types of things they can't that's the problem I think is the Pelicans struggle with adapting to certain teams because they aren't as flexible as they would like to be particularly at the point guard and two guard position and having people they trust to create there and then at the center spot yeah you're on point I mean Memphis's physicality just overwhelmed Sacramento's speed and playing with force overwhelmed. And then you play the teams that have stars like Denver, how Jokic could just, you couldn't deter him, right? And I know that the Pelicans in a regular season beat the Thunder three out of four times, but I'll tell you what, Shea lit him up every single night. Every time. So the Pelicans from a strategy standpoint, as, as we talked about, can improve, but I also think the roster and even though the talent, I think the core, the talent of the core is outstanding. I don't think that's a concern. I don't think I would shake up, say, about seven or eight guys. But it's who you put around them, right? So for Willie to have to go to a Kyra Lewis who hasn't played, and that's partially due to his fault because I don't think he gave him enough run to get him ready for the playing tournament, or having to rely on a Jackson Hayes who just never developed. We never saw him take a step forward with his progress. And then so when Larry's hurt and you've got Billy who's honestly on, on Jonas's kind of level in terms of what he can provide out there um, athletically, well, that's just not enough, right? So the holes are apparent. You don't have a leader at the point guard position that can get you set up in the offense, even though I think Jose, maybe he can get there, right? But he wasn't available for the last 20 games. And it's, and it's always going to be hard for a guy right at six feet or under to give you that. Yeah, I think of Jose Barea. So I think in his role, he could be okay, right? But don't Does ask he shoot as well as Jose Barea? Like Jose Barea could give you 30 on a on – a, like – just yeah, come up I and get they can get there. But what I guess what I'm getting at is, is doing that consistently. Yeah. So say if you need him to do it for two weeks, start like minutes, I'm not sure. 
I know he wants to. Boy, I'll tell you what, he was so excited about uh, talking about what he's going to do this summer in his exit interview. He has so much energy. I thought he was going to jump through the gym when he was talking to us because he's that type of guy. So it must have killed him, right, sitting and watching these last final games. But I think Jose is the type of guy you don't worry about. He's going to put in the work. Just like Trey, he's going to put in the work. Herb, we saw what he he's always done. And I thought he'd finish off the season. Herb's well. so probably the gym right point. now. Herb's I'm not worried about it. Right and, and, now. But, but there's holes on the roster that you still got to fill. And I guess, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that now or – yeah, before I Maybe get to on that, another episode. Yeah, I, I think we'll get to that, to that when we yeah. really start evaluating. You know, once we start talking about contracts and stuff, this is more of a wrap. You know, yeah, and and and, and what I wanted to talk about. Somebody brought up a, a real point about the psych, sports psychology, and and the the and and Stan Van Gundy talked about it kind of in his Instagram comments in a roundabout way, the psychology of reaching Zion Williamson. I think that this the their I think that one of the things that Griff is going to look at, I honestly believe this because Griff is a guy who strikes me as somebody who looks at a holistic approach to building his basketball team. He's trying to figure out how many things he can get to support his team to make it last and work. Absolutely. Yeah. I would not be surprised if there's this, because when you think about over the last couple of years, what these guys have been through just to, with the pandemic and what they had to deal with professionally with that, the physical injuries that Zion Williamson has gone through, the transition that he's gone through. And I'm not, I'm just using him as an example because I think this is probably up and down the roster for a number of guys in things that you could just work on. The mental approach to this and figuring out your place at it within your team, within this league, and to have the confidence to come back from all these things. I would bet that there is a sports psychologist or some type of role either behind the scenes that, that comes along to help these guys because you saw – that's the Zion Teresa Witherspoon relationship. You know, you have to have something also to go along with that because even within that coach player dynamic, there are things I can't do with you as a coach. So I think that having that other layer of confidentiality and the lack of control over like playing time and stuff, a person who's that voice, I would not be surprised the Pelicans had that to, to their. I, want, I do want to say that um, they did hire somebody a couple years ago, Jenna Rosen. They hired her for director of mental health and wellness. And I remember her, I think, coming on board right around the pandemic, around the bubble time. So I know that they have tried to plug that hole. I'm not sure how much, you know, how effective that's, right, been. That's, that's been. Because we haven't largely heard from any player or anybody else on, you're not going to divulge, right, what you're telling uh, your psychologist right, but that you've gone or a doctor. It. But I still haven't heard enough to where, okay, I've gone through something and I've gone to her or I feel better. You know, you know, we, we haven't heard any references right to her position or her uh, advice or anything like that so maybe it is something that you know obviously griff's going to evaluate every area but maybe that is something else you need to explore to where you can find somebody that the players you know just have a more comfortability in talking to i'm not sure like i said i don't want to speculate because this is all speculation mm -hmm. on my part but like i said I, I know they have somebody like i said named jenna rosen who is open has an open door to all of them I think that do you the likelihood, I think there is a likelihood that there will either be an addition to the coaching staff at the very least, or there will be a couple of departures. I believe that there has to be some shakeup to this staff, particularly. And I know everyone else wants to see it on the offensive side, either as a consultant or as a voice on the bench with Willie Green. I think there needs to be an experienced uh, mind to to join this staff. Yeah, I can't argue it. I mean, you can't go for three months, and even though you're missing your best firepower in Zion, and, and Brandon Ingram missed a large amount of time too, it's the fact that, like I said, when you don't go to your strengths, when you don't get the right shots, if you can't get to that step consistently, that's a problem. So I know Mike D'Antoni, right? He was a consultant. And according to Griff, I think they um, hit him up liberally is the way he put, right? So it's not like they went to him often asking for advice, but... I didn't see it translate, right? I think you need to have, honestly, consultants are one thing, but I think you need to have somebody in-house sitting on the bench right there, right? So I think Willie largely improved, right, from where he was a season ago. I think that Jaron Collins does a great job defensively, right? He's their defensive coordinator. But offensively, I'm still at a loss at who is the person that you can rely on every time there's a problem, especially when you're in kind of a funk, right? 
because they didn't show a way out, right? When they were they were spiraling spiraling for months. So I, I think that's where you look, right? Because the player development coaches from everybody I've talked to, every player, they love them, right? From Corey Brewer to Teaspoon to some of the lesser knowns like Brian Pennell, who uh, was the G League uh, head coach last season for their squad. All these guys have gotten glowing assessments by everybody. But in terms of right next to Willie, yeah, I think you could probably find a spot for somebody that's got been through the wars and can help you. When people talk about the staff changes, otherwise, you know, they like to talk about the medical staff, which I don't think is nearly a, as big a problem as other people do. Because the majority of the games missed are coming from the same players. It's not as if there's a, an up and down the roster level of injuries. Jose's is the kind of injury that you don't really count on. It's, I mean, that that yeah. that's not something that you that that we've seen happen regularly with this team. So, but the, the injuries to BI over the last two years, I don't put those on the training staff. I don't yeah. think we had any indication that those were on the training staff and their rehabilitation program. The same thing with Zion. I do not put necessarily his injury history on them. And I don't put his recovery because we know again, now I agree this when Stan Van Gundy statement that whatever has happened has not worked. Whatever the system is that is in place has not worked. I think they will reassess, but I don't think it's the people themselves or the staff and their approach that's the problem. And that's what makes David Griffin's job, I think, awfully hard because he told us he's going to evaluate the process from top to bottom. And there's no obvious glaring red lights blinking, right? Because he even said, yes, we've missed a whole bunch of games uh, due to injury. That Zion has always consistently been out for longer than expected. And he said it himself, and it's the best way to put it. It's not like we're doing the wrong things or it's not like we're seeing, not, you know, ing ingesting the problem and trying to figure out a solution. It's like we, they, they basically tried everything. It's just the fact that, yeah, you've got to find something maybe that does click. So that's 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 what they're going to be doing. Lastly, as far as staff goes, I don't think Willie Green gets like an extension or anything this offseason. So that means he goes into next season is the, the, the third of his fourth four years on his contract, right? I next year, so. the year three. I don't think he goes into the year with an extension beyond year four. It's a very critical year for Willie. Your thoughts on what he can do to improve? Because I think the biggest thing for Willie is to relax a little bit. And I'm not saying that in a way of like um, become a looser person overall. I'm just saying I think Willie needs to enjoy the job a little bit, be the coach, and 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 because you see he wears this man, he's wearing it, the job itself, not the wins and the losses, but you can see everything is weighing on him. We need to see more of that first year Willie, the guy who was a little bit more chest strong. I think this year there was a lot of damage done to his psyche because of the way this season went. I hope that the offseason gives him that refresher because I think Willie, would, you could see the, the weight of this season was on his, his shoulders during that final game. Yeah, last year there were no expectations, especially after they started three and 16. And, and so obviously there was no pressure. Nobody expected anything. People were writing off the Pelicans a quarter of the season in. This year they started with expectations and they only grew right? You're 23 and 12. So obviously you're under a magnifying glass. And I think there's faults that Willie Green can improve upon. I mean, let's face it. We've talked about, I think on a previous episode that there's a certain stubbornness about him. So he's willing to stick to rotations a lot more tightly rather than seeing how the game is progressing. Right? So for instance, for me, it, it's like, if you've got a player out there, that's really got it going like Brandon Ingram, and then you specifically take him out at certain points of the game. And towards the end of the season, it was he played the whole first quarter. Why not maybe have him start the first few minutes of the second quarter? Why not maybe coach more by feel, right? So that would be one example I could point to. Another one is honestly just getting your team to focus on where you should be attacking, where your strengths are, to make sure you utilize them. It's great that you talk about, okay, we're going to utilize Jonas, but it seems like the Pelicans, when they talked about doing it, games would start, he'd get two or three touches, right? And then they would go away from him for his next 12 minutes, not even look at him. Stuff like that shouldn't happen. And again, to me, that falls more into coaching. I know, I know it's on the players to execute, and I know that you're probably in your ears telling them the right things. 
but that message has to get conveyed, right? Yep. So that, I don't know what that means. Does that mean that Willie needs to be more forceful? Does he need to take a different approach? Maybe somebody else on the staff he should dedicate in conveying that message. I'm not sure. But from that standpoint, that can be improved upon. And lastly, it's a strategy thing. I don't know how many times we talked about the lack of three-point shots and how many times he told us that that is something that they're trying to do more of to get Trey Murphy more shots, but it never translated, right? So that is something that can continue to happen. So I've just basically knocked all the negatives that I've got, but I do want to say that I think Willie is the right coach for this team. It's a young team. Building relationships is by far the most important, and he has successfully done it since he got here day one. He's never lost the year of any single player. He has a certain steady and calm that I think is necessary for a young team. So when you go through the doldrums, for instance, a Stan, I know that he would yell. He flat out upset a lot of the players last year because of that's who he is as a coach, right? Off the court, he's an entirely different guy. But when he's on the court, he's going to go into that mode where he's just basically cursing at you because – so-and-so beat you. And I'm not talking about LeBron James. I'm talking about some lesser player. You let him beat you. So he was talking to them in that manner. As to where we know in today's game, almost all NBA players don't accept don't messages like that, right? That They'll way. tune you out. So from that standpoint, I love that Willie has taken all the right approaches with his players in terms of communication. It's just that he's got to become more effective, David. I think a little more direct. I don't think he has – I think he Maybe. needs to worry less and not be – as you know, that player part of him, I think that wanting to understand what the player is going through in that mode, I get it. You remember how I he could get it. Devontae Graham to go from a starter yeah. to, I think he went to his house to talk to him about moving him to a, a, a roll off the bench and then to the point of where we thought he shouldn't have been in the rotation, but he kept on playing him. Yeah, I see your point right there. Just through Devontae. Just, you just got to cut things at, at some point. You've got to, he's got to start treating these young players like grownups. And I think that's what, you see in Oklahoma City, I think that's what you saw Mike Brown bring to the young guys who had looked for some purpose in Sacramento. Because remember, when Alvin was was on the bench in Sacramento, before they cha- made some changes, before they got Sabonis and brought all those guys in, remember, he was on the sideline after they had fired, and he comes in his intro, and he's like just yelling at that team, like, what are you doing? Because they were not mentally where they needed to be. It wasn't Alvin's message to convey. Mike Brown figured it out. That's where Willie has to get is like you is, is conveying that message consistently so that people understand what their roles are and their expectations and that there are swift consequences when you step out of those things. Not that you feel like the hook is coming, not yeah. that you're looking over your shoulder, but you know that when you make the mental mistake that you are not supposed to make, the ones that you've been trained and disciplined that are on the scouting report, there's accountability for that. Yeah. And you know where that comes out and he had no problems really setting down Jackson Hayes, right, when he made some mistakes. Same thing just happened with Dyson Daniels, right? He didn't see game action. But then there's players like Josh Richardson who honestly didn't play well for maybe a week and a half or something like that. He still got regular run. There was times when I thought Najee Marshall shouldn't touch a court, but yet he still went to Najee, even though he was playing poorly, not giving you anything out there. So for me, it's treating everybody the same, seeing them in the same eyes, and coming to the same conclusion, like if you can do that and put down Jackson on the bench because he's not giving you what you need, you've got to be able to do that with pretty much everybody else on your roster. I can be upset with you and be respectful to you. You know what I mean? I can tell you you're messing up. Oh, he'll always being, be respectful. There's no doubt Willie's always going to be ex- you know, respectful. Like, right? Will, and, but Willie needs to – like it's okay for you to be upset with guys during the game if they're not executing. It's okay to be direct and, and say, this isn't enough, guys. Not just yeah, David, well, you know what was strange. Sorry, you just reminded me of the fact that effort was never a problem with this team once it got going last year and into this season. And then once the losses start coming, every other game to sometimes back to back games, we were questioning effort. effort. And he was trying to, exp- he, he was, I don't know how to put it, but Willie was basically not making excuses, but saying, Yeah, it happened again. That shocked me, right? For remember, it's a non negotiable. That's what he always said last year. So it kind of, it makes you wonder what happened this year. How come all of a sudden there was instances where it was allowed to happen too frequently? And I think that's what David Griffin, the biggest thing that the front office can do is change the level of the you know, of, of basketball IQ for the players that Willie has. There won't be wholesale op, uh, changes. There won't yeah. be. 
The Pelicans are not abandoning ship on this. People think that they're going to trade Zion Williamson this offseason. That ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. They're not going to trade Brandon Ingram this offseason. It's not going to happen. Whatever is going to happen is to, to be to support primarily the six guys that they've identified mm-hmm. as the, the, the critical yeah. pieces of this franchise. Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson, C.J. McCollum, Trey Murphy, Herb Jones, Jose Alvarado. I'd say Larry Nance too. I throw Larry. Well, I mean, Larry is. A, I'm talking about as Larry's a a a a veteran piece, but I'm saying the other six are the the guys that they would prefer never to get rid of right now. Who are going to give you? You know, Larry is is at the. Again, I think Larry's there, David. He's on a great. I'm, I'm saying his value yeah. is value. Yeah. Larry's yeah. value is for the Pelicans is a yeah. different value than where you would say. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Larry's yeah. value is yeah. to the Pelicans. Yeah, I'm just saying those seven to me are safe. They can't really move Larry anyway. I'm saying you can't. Nobody's asking for Larry today. Somebody might ask for Jose. Somebody might ask for Herb. Somebody might ask for Trey. But no, those guys aren't going anywhere. Yeah, I'm. I'm just pointing out the guys I think are safe, right? So, unless it's some kind of miraculous trade, I see Larry staying. I see Dyson staying. I even see Kyra staying, right? Because. Unless you, it's, unless they're part of a deal for somebody, a deal else. that really helps you, yeah, exactly. Because you don't, really, none of the guys really. We'll have get into that. We'll get yeah. into that in future episodes. But I think yeah, we got to take a I'm, good look at this the roster. Part for me is that the front office is going to try to find some more of those guys that are going to be more of the CJ Larry variety at this stage mm-hmm. than young guys with upside. This team does not need more young guys with upside. I'll be shocked if they draft and keep their pick. Tell you I'll right be now. shocked too. I Unless think, it's Victor Wembanyama or Scoot Henderson. If I don't they don't jump up to the top them. four, if they don't jump into that region. I think it's top two. I think it's top two. I mean, two. even in top four, you might get – I mean, it, it, see what the value is. Yeah, you see what the value is. You know, you never know. But, yeah, yeah it'd have to be something miraculous. I think They have enough young they guys. They don't need another rookie. Yeah. yeah. They don't need another rookie. And I think the front office – I think Griffiths has figured that out. We ha- we tried to raise these kids. It was too many. We found the two, that, the three that we really like in Herb, Trey, and Jose. They like those three. Everybody else, they hope. hope. Plus, you can find talent around the margins, which mm-hmm. they've shown, shown a great job to do. You have a G League team where you can grow that talent. Yep. So there's no reason to even draft and put that guy on your 15-man roster. Yeah, you I agree. need veterans who you can count on that I know what you're going to give me in your 15 minutes. And you complement the skill sets that I don't have. I we will, like I said, we'll get into the names and that stuff as we get into the summer. The other thing though is 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 the Zion question. I don't have a problem. With, uh, you know, people will say, should they trade in this offseason? I don't have a problem with holding, because again, I think we've always said this: you do not give up on that level of talent without exhausting the possibilities first. And they have not exhausted the possibilities on how to make this work. You have to exhaust it. And then when you have fully said, we've done everything possible and it's not going to work here, then you deal with it. Couldn't agree more. I don't even really want to entertain the thought. Zion was playing at an MVP caliber. So we always thought he was a generational talent. He actually showed it on the court. And this is without even growing his game yet, right, David? He's got 114 games under his professional belt. So the playmaking was coming around. He even started shooting maybe a little bit the mini right now and then but boy he still has so much room for growth and he was already being such a big difference maker wins and losses and i can't not forget to mention defensively he was actually making an impact in those important minutes with something defensively there's no way you give up on that player and he's about to start a five-year contract so that means you've got him under control for a long time it is so hard for a small market team that has not had sustained record of success on acquiring that type of talent. So why would you give him away? No, I don't see it. No, the key is the supporting cast. That's what it's going to be. When people want to talk about the Joel Embiid thing, I think the biggest thing you look at, the Sixers are about a 67% winning team with Joel Embiid's on the floor over the last five years. He missed the first two seasons. He's played the last five. He averages about... 60 games a season. That's what he averages, about 60 games a season. But the Sixers, when they, when he's gone, are still a 52% win team. And so, the Pelicans part, remember? Yeah. So what we've seen is it, it's we've slowly Get started done. to raise the floor for the Pelicans, but they've got to jump that level of the floor up because the, with Zion over his career in the 114 games, Pelicans are a 500 team. Without him, they're a 42% win team. 
that's an improvement because where it started when Zion was gone, they were awful. They were not winning games at all. And so I, I think it's, it's getting, if Griffin could continue to raise the floor, you can withstand these periods if Zion does miss five or 10 games exactly. over the course of any stretch during the season. And the Pelicans can't do that right now. We keep talking about the margin for error being so thin. It's because of the people behind them. And I think I'm glad that David Griffin finally recognizes, and I hope that they go out and get Zion and, and, and get JB good quality backups. Because if they do that, yeah, you, you're talking about potentially being a 50-win team. And if you go from 42 wins to 48 to 50 next year, and you're firmly in that top six, that's where you want to be. That's where the Pelicans have to be. Exactly. I hope everybody doesn't forget, this is still a young team at its core. I mean, you remove CJ and Larry, and I guess Jonas, but we're not counting them as the core here. They're extremely young. So when I say extremely young, they're inexperienced when it comes to winning, right? And that's something that can only take place on the court together. So, yeah, bottom line is you've got to figure out a way to get B.I., Zion, 60 games each. And then for those moments when you don't have them, like you just said, to have the quality of backups to where you can win. And like I said, the start of the season, they were able to sustain. I remember some big wins like against Dallas and a few others to where guys like Dyson Daniels stepped up to help you win. Larry, Jose, right? Jose's 30. They were a 500 team without tender. Zion. But you need more than that. You injury. can't just have, like, say, those three names I mentioned. you got to be even deeper than that. So, yeah. I, I'm confident that this organization sees those problems better than they ever have, the problems that exist, and they're going to address them. And we'll see. And 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 I think people, we want to make sure that you understand that we are neither advocating for or against the, the franchise as far as that goes. We're going to see. And whatever they do, we're going to be taking a critical eye at it and, and, and seeing what we think. But I, I, I agree with you. And you know me, I'm as very harsh on David Griffin. But what he said today, before we even got on, I said, I thought that was the best I've heard from Griff. And I, I think he was as I, I will give him credit for what he said prior to Zion's uh, press conference. I thought he was fair in his statements then, and I thought he was fair in his statements today. So I give David Griffith credit. Now the proof will be in the pudding, just like it is every year for a sports team. Yeah, I've got nothing to add. Well said. All right. Um, we will be doing these bi-weekly as we go through the summer. Um, you know, I don't think we need to do them every day. We don't. There's not going to be that kind of news breaking, but if there is something, we will certainly react to it. But we're going to be consistent for you throughout the offseason. And we just want you to, to, to continue to um, get people to listen, get people to uh, you know download and sign up to, to follow the podcast wherever you get it. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, share it and, and watch it and, and get it to folks as well. Because uh, yeah. we're really excited about where we're headed. Yeah, and I just want to add that for those people wondering about whether David Fish, Kevin Barrios, others are going to join us, again, they will. And then for any of your questions, we're most certainly going to start addressing those, especially because we're, we've got an off season, right? So that's what we're going to mainly focus on. So yeah. keep those questions coming and uh, give us any kind of advice you guys have for us. And check out the new website because it, we've, we've changed the look and we're continuing to add to it. It's a work in progress and uh, we just want you to continue to enjoy it and give us your feedback there too. We appreciate the comments and we're going to continue to make it more user-friendly for you. Um, Ollie, I think that's it for this one. Yeah, that's a wrap, buddy. All right, folks. He's Ollie Cosell. You follow him at Ollie Cosell on Twitter and Instagram. And I am at DM Grub. Until the next time, let's go, Pills. <laughs>